sort of spend most of our time in two, so don't worry about threes too many. Uh, so they're Alpha, Beta, and Charlie. Uh, and I've got their connectivity on the whiteboard on both sides, uh, meaning that there's internet connect, internet connectivity, like internet protocol, and then, you know, and think of that as, you know, it could be at a great distance or it could be, you know, a cable between the two. Uh, but there's internet connectivity via internet protocol between A and B. In B and C, there is a direct way to use internet protocol for A to talk to C. Okay, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna get Tink, uh, which is a really simple uh, virtual private networking daemon uh, running, uh, and you'll see that it's uh, it's it's more of a peer to peer model than a client server model. Okay, so I've already done this uh, and do whatever is appropriate in your environment. Um, so one of the design principles on Tink is that you've got, uh, you can run multiple networks. So the convention on that is to create a separate subdirectory in Etsy Tink. So we're gonna create Mugnet today. And then you always end up with a directory in here called hosts. And we're gonna create a Tink.conf. And this one file could be as simple as just having having one line in it, uh, like the line I just put there. Okay, um, so this parameter is the, um, the, the name that, for the purposes of the VPN network, uh, that the uh, uh, nodes will identify each other with. Uh, so it doesn't have to match, like I have here, but I'm just choosing to use the same names. Um, okay, so now that I have um, a directory for our network and a host directory under that and a basic tink.conf, I can do this. So anytime you do have um, different networks you're managing, you have to use this dash n. And then the dash k will generate uh, private and public key pairs. So there's the private key. And the public key ended up in the host directory uh, with that name uh, that I gave to this node. Okay, so I've already done those steps on this one. So we're going to uh, copy that, copy the public keys to be on both sides. This is, you have to have, you have to manually move public keys around um, to do this, but uh, you'll see there's some advantages to that. Okay, so hosts, oh, we'll just use this, cap, hosts, alpha. And I think I, I checked this over and over, but I'm gonna just be sure that the way I copy pasted there didn't actually result in uh, lines being messed up. So let's just be absolutely sure about that at a lower resolution. So tink. There we go, that's how it's supposed to look. Uh, there's the right number of dashes and stuff. Okay, good. So that was a successful copy paste. We gotta do the same thing in this direction. So uh, public key, I've, public private key pair I've already created on this side. I should start from the top. And we're gonna copy that out a little bit later. Okay, so we've manually exchanged public keys. Uh, between uh, alpha and beta. Now what we're going to do is um, some of the configura there's configuration options in the tink.conf and then there's t configuration options that you put in the, uh, the different slash hosts files. So some of these options, like the one I'm going to put here, are for um, 
your information that your daemon, your tink daemon will provide to the other tink daemons. So we're going to use the subnet clause. So what this means is that uh, this tink daemon, when it talks to the other tink daemons, is going to say that um, the um, the networks that it knows about, um, inc including itself, um, are um, what do we provide here? So I'm using a slash 32 to say that this host alpha only knows about uh, one host, um, and just and that's going to be itself. So this is going to be um, the other hosts are going to find out that okay alpha alpha has that, and I actually only need to put that in the config that's on the alpha side because uh, when the daemons connect and they, they talk to each other using the public keys and, uh, and those names from the tink.conf, uh, um, this is just something that this one will pass on to the other ones. It's like, okay, about me. So we're gonna do that symmetrically. We're gonna do that on this side. Um, oh yeah, so it's already, it's already done on this side actually. Uh, I already have a subnet clause ready here. So this is the address that uh, beta is going to advertise to the network it's responsible for, uh, which will be just its own address on the, the network, the, uh, the, private, the virtual private network that's going to be formed. Okay. So one last thing. Uh, all right, I'm going to ch just do this one more time. Data though. Okay. Right. So this is a clause. The address clause is more of a what happens on the actual. Um, it's where you identify how over the internet or over your local network or whatever how how these tink nodes are actually going to find each other before they can form a private network. So we're telling, um, we're giving Alpha a little bit more information about how to actually connect to the uh, beta node uh, by doing that. And then uh, we can add one more line in this tink.conf, connect to, uh, here we use the name of the, uh, the host file. And you'll see this uh, one on beta, tink.conf, it's, it's a one-liner, uh, like I started with on the other one. So we have a tink.conf on one machine that's one line, we have two lines on the other machine, and we have some public keys that we've exchanged and like one line each that we've had to exchange on each side. Uh, now, it would be nice if that were the end of it, um, but there is one more thing we have to do. Uh, tink relies on, once it, um, tink daemons find each other, uh, and are communicating to each other over, over say, the public internet, or whichever network that already exists. Uh, the um, the daemons will be talking to each other, but to actually configure the virtual interfaces that the daemons bring up on your system, uh, you have to do a little bit of scripting. Uh, so Tink sort of delegates that to you when those when the net when the virtual private network interface comes up, it runs a script of yours, and your script decides how it wants to actually configure that interface. So, uh, but this is pretty quick and easy. Uh, and then this ends up being uh, operating system dependent, which is nice because it actually allows you to maybe support more operating systems and have let the tink daemon be less responsible for that. Okay, so we need a tink up script. Okay, so um, I always use uh, full pass when I don't know what the environment's going to be. Um, so this is the Linux IP command. Uh, I'm doing a link status. And so this, is, this environment variable is set by the tink daemon before it calls your script.
So what I've kind of fulfilled here with this tink up is the, uh, actually before I forget, I'll get that execute permissions. What I've fulfilled is here in host slash alpha, the copy of it that's on alpha, I've said that I'm going to advertise to the other tink daemons that uh, I know all about 192.168.20.1, uh, just, just that IP address, because uh, it's going to be mine. Uh, and so then it's only here, like there I'm making a promise that the other tink daemons will be told about. It's only here that I actually fulfill that promise and actually after the, the tink daemons are talking to each other and the, the virtual network interface is up, I actually configure that network interface to have, have that address. So that script goes into the network specific direct subject? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I, I gave it execute, right? And then there's one more. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to hear our Tink Daemon is going to hear other Tink Daemons advertising that they know about different subnets. And so uh, we have to put those into our routing table. How does it do it? I'm sorry? How do you say it's, it's site to site? Yeah, so the daemons are talking to each other over just, say, the public internet. Can they person. propagate those broadcasts? A broadcast of, of what? They're using a port communicate, I'm thinking. So how, how does he see whether A is there? Is he broadcasting A is there to see? Oh, you, you'll see a demo of that right. after. Yeah. Not too far off. Okay. All right. That's. I believe that's everything. So I'm going to start this daemon first. And you can see that uh, a network interface called Mugnet uh, was created uh, when the daemon came up, and the IP address was configured by the uh, the tink up script running. Okay, that will bring up this one. And I am going to look at the routing table right away here because that's what I always get fascinated by. Okay. So this is an entry in Alpha's routing table uh, that is only there because of that subnet up script running. So this is this is what Beta uh, advertised was a, a network or individual IP address that it knew about uh, its own, and uh, Alpha added it to its routing table. So we can actually uh, we can ping this now, and I can ping. Yes. So this is me now sending pings over the virtual private network through the tunnel, not over like the public network that the daemons are talking on. So those those pings are encrypted. Uh, I can just I can demonstrate it with netcat as well. It's more fun. This is what I meant to do. Listen. So that hello world was encrypted and carried by the VPN. Okay, so here's our, uh, so we built a VPN between A and B uh, relatively easily with like uh, just a few lines of configuration and some of it was shell script and some of it was configuration. So that's maybe the most challenging part is that there's a mix here. It's a little bit of script, a little bit of configuration. Uh, now here's the real fun. I bring this one up. I've already got the config ready to go. Presumably, for those two up scripts you created, you'd have a counterpart down script to down the interface. Yeah, that's all available, and, and same for the subnet down. Uh, I built it here just uh, just without. I have the the actual. You don't really need so much a down script for the interface because 
if the daemon goes down, then the virtual interface that the daemon was creating on the system anyway, the whole interface goes down, and then a lot of resources associated with that are going to get torn away anyway. Uh, it's more the routing table entries that you might want to clean up. So that's more the, uh, the subnet down. Uh, but I've been living fine with production systems even without that. Like, okay, so I have some routing table entries that aren't going to work, but that's the only route, that's the only way I'm going to reach that, these, you know, bunch of private addresses I'm using anyway. So it's either, it's either unreachable without a routing table entry, it's unreachable with a, a routing table entry that's out of date, or it's reachable with a routing table entry that actually is, uh, reflects a uh, network that is together. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we have a routing table entry for, uh, the way I'm doing this with that subnet op script right now is a little redundant. We're adding routing table entries for ourselves. Uh, so that's what this one is. But here is on C, we have a routing table entry for um, D's, uh, uh, beta's uh, private, uh, virtual private network address, and we have a routing table entry for, for A's. And so we can, uh, we can do the same uh, stuff with netcat again. Okay, so that hello world uh, went through uh, went through this VPN and uh, went from uh, went from A to C, and we didn't even have any configuration on Alpha about C. Uh, we had A and B having to know about each other and each other's public keys and uh, names, and we had B and C knowing about each other's uh, public keys and each other's names. But as soon as C came onto the network. Uh, information about it was actually uh, made available and uh, sometimes these will even find actually ways to directly start sharing traffic re with each other if it actually is possible. Uh, otherwise the traffic actually all gets passed through a node like that. Uh, okay, I think that's the kind of like that we're in a daemon dash, so um, I guess we'll do a few questions. Um, not necessarily a question, but you're talking about forwarding traffic through B. Mm -hmm. um, Right. Well, yeah. You can you can get you can build your networks in with a complicated mix of. Here we have the Tink daemon doing all of the routing. Uh, so this you can't tell from the routing table here on Alpha. We have we have it directly saying, oh, through the virtual private network, however it's formed, however it's put together, I'm able to reach. Uh, this line here is for uh, Charlie. Uh, Right, and then the Tink daemon does the routing. But the Tink daemon also has settings where you can say, oh, well, uh, in some circumstances, let's bring my own routing table into play. So you could do something, for example, like where in, your, in a, one of these uh, host files, you could advertise a subnet that's not part of the virtual private network, but for which you are a, uh, a router to, and you could advertise this to the world, hey, send your traffic through the virtual private network, and then I'm going to take it from there, and my routing table is going to take over from there, uh, etc. So yeah, you can build you can build net mixed networks out of this. Uh, well, what would happen if we were saying? I'll just grab a marker here. If uh, if Charlie were say advertising some multi-node. You know, let's call it a physical network that's on a switch, and it was advertising to these other ones. The routing table entry on here would look no different than the routing table entries it has for B and C. Uh, for this, let's call this network D. You know. The routing table entry on A would say, you know, and we'll call this uh, 172. Uh, 35. Am I in the private range? Uh, o, not o slash 24, uh, this network D. So you'd have a routing table entry on A that says uh, the virtual private network, not even saying which node, but the virtual private network managed by the Tink daemon uh, has that. And then you have, the virtual, you have the Tink daemon doing all the routing all the way up to here. 
And then you have the tink daemon saying, oh, I'm gonna, I don't need to do any more routing on this. I'm going to pass it on to the, the kernel's routing table to, to do further routing on. Right, so basically tink is actually forwarding the routing messages between each of the nodes that it knows about. Yeah, but it has its own routing protocol. Right. It has its own routing protocol. Right, but then you have to tell it something to keep talking about something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and but you don't really, you can't know sort of the the real topology of this from necessarily the routing table entry, eh, routing table on A. All you're going to see is, yeah, somehow through this virtual private network, uh, which you know has the ability to reform itself, right? Somehow there's something that's going to get through here. Um, anyways, it's definitely uh, harder to manage when you start mixing. Uh, different uh, the responsibility for the routing being at different places too. Can, can B snoop on A to C's traffic? Or is it using like A and C's keys and not B's keys? No, I, I think there's actual uh, key exchange going on. Um, but I think to set it up, if you wanted to be sure, you didn't want to trust B to tell you what the public key of C is, you would have to seed those keys ahead of time. Oh, okay. So you could have B doing the bouncing, and you can trust it as long as you set up the public keys on both ends ahead of time. Right, right. Otherwise, yeah, there would be a person in the middle attack there if, uh, uh, if B advertised different public keys. Does it have the capability of uh, specifying the port that it runs on? And TCP? Yes, Through yes, proxy? yes, I have used it. I specifically have used it in some contexts to uh, the on to get through tunnel through very restrictive networks where I'm going out on TCP 443. <laughs> also through a proxy or no? You mean like an HTTP proxy? No, it takes protocol isn't going to support that. Uh, you know, here I'm going to ask myself a question because this is a common one. Uh, everything I did here today was layer three internet protocol being passed from Tink Daemon to Tink Daemon. Uh, does it do? layer two in the form of Ethernet. Yes, you can configure it to. Yes. Are they ever going to support something besides SSL and TLS? Because I like the protocol of spec, but I may not want to deal with SSL and TLS. Oh. Because maybe the IP stack is a frame support, for example. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know uh, uh, how they're, uh, they're, how they're, um, Honestly, I don't know what the Tink Daemons are using to talk to each other. You said you did some research on this? No, no, no. I was wondering if they actually were going to, uh, we're going we're gonna to allow pluggable transport networks. That's all. Well, that would be a nice feature, yeah. I think the key thing, though, is um, often when you bring up something like TLS is uh, the key exchange model, right? And do you have a certificate authority in that? Tink, Tink doesn't have any of that. It's always for two nodes that are going to be exchanging like this, you exchange the public keys ahead of time. Um, to both sides. Now, what they do with those public keys, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, they're, prob they're probably, you know, they're probably using some kind of TLS after, after that, but it's not like it's, um, it's not like it's relying on a certificate authority or anything. But yeah, if you're talking about pluggable transports, uh, there you go, you know, it'd be nice to have an HTTP proxy as a pluggable transport. <laughs> yeah, that, going to the other question. <laughs> Huh? Oh yes, yeah. Well, yeah. On, on both on both uh, sides, the uh, Tink demons talking to each other on the public internet can use IPv6, and they um, and then actually carried through the Tink uh, demons talking to each other, uh, they can do IPv6. And actually, another question along those lines: Do these talk to each other? The demons talk to each other with UDP or TCP? Yeah, they can do both. So ideally, you'll hope they can have UDP connectivity to each other because they're wrapping IP packets in that, and that's a lot closer. It's not socketed. Uh, IP isn't, but uh, it can do. You can force it to TCP. Yeah, it's encrypted. Yeah. So those hello worlds and pings I was sending, uh, those were all encrypted. You have to see the manual. Yeah, 
Oh, well, okay. That's a good. That's a, no. That's a perfectly. That's a perfectly good question. It's. No, someone said kill that dash nine option. So yeah, that dash lowercase k is to uh, is to kill a daemon. Uh, dash capital K is to create your uh, public private key kit pairs if you don't have them yet. I'm sorry to ask the question because I missed most of it. Um, what can I can I get this for like OpenBSD? Not that I would ever want to. Like FreeBSD? Yeah, I, I believe it has very wide operating system support, and okay. in some cases. There was operating systems where you know they have this distinction. Um, you know, Tink relies on the operating system providing a service where the operating system will create a virtual network interface and then let the daemon actually control what goes in and out of that. Uh, some operating systems provide what's called a uh, a ton and tap style, so uh, a virtual interface that uh, works on an internet protocol level is a ton, I think, and one that uh, can do um, Ethernet packets is a TAP. So I think I read that some of the operating systems only have ton for support for, um, for uh, exchanging just internet protocol packets. So you can't use the support Tink has for carrying uh, Ethernets uh, on, the, on those operating systems where that's more limited. So that's one of the ones. But yeah, it, it has a wide operating system support list, and one reason for that was because what I presented there, the actual, um, once that virtual interface that the operating system provides to Tink is brought up, it's up to your script to then configure that interface to have an address and to configure the routing table. So that all ends up being done in an operating system specific way, and it's not the responsibility of the Tink developers, it's the responsibility of you, the user, and that lets actually Tink support lots of operating systems because they don't have to worry about those final details. They just, all they, what they really need to support an operating system is a working IP layer to have the daemons talk to each other and an operating system API that allows you to create a, um, a virtual interface that you uh, can either put internet protocol packets in and out of uh, or, and or uh, ethernet packets in and out of. I don't have the OS support list memorized, so you'll have to check the website, but I, I know it's wide. Uh, I know it includes includes Windows, includes Mac OS, uh, it's not just Unixes. All right, we should call that at the end, and uh, we'll break for, uh, let's say, just over 10-ish minutes for uh, breaks and snacks. Thanks, Mark.